They check out. <laughs> hey, glad to see you all out tonight. And uh, the hot weather continues, but uh, I just feel like I've got to give a weather report for all the people listening in. Just Dad always wonders, what's it like down there, you know? So uh, hot. But guess what it's like back in Illinois? Hot and even more humid. Uh, people don't understand the humidity in Illinois this time of year when you've got uh, 12 foot tall corn and corn and corn and corn, a few soybeans entered in. Man, it's just like unbelievable how the, those green plants just give off and give off and give off. And so it's just like sweltering. Um, but this is the time of year we always had the two a day football practices, which that just increased the intensity of those was having that high humidity along with the heat. But um, anyway, we're not here to walk beans tonight, have football practice, or talk about the weather. But instead, we're going to get to talk about Jesus a little bit tonight. So if you've got your Bibles and you want to go back to this Revelation 21, uh, we're getting close, folks, close to the end. So you won't want to miss anything between now and the end. Cause, you know, there, but there isn't a sequel after this, uh, at least that we know of. There will be a sequel, so to speak, but uh, we'll get to live it instead of having to read it. And I think one of these days, God's going to make all this come to life even far more than we've ever dreamed or imagined. But uh, appreciate you being here tonight, and let's go to God in prayer, if you will. Dear God, thank you that you want us to pray. Listen to us while we pray. I don't know how painful that might be at times. And I just don't think that we grasp uh, your love. I mean, it's just beyond the human nature, um, even though there are places and things that we can see it in. And whether it's the love of our pets, Lord, and the way they love us back, whether it's the love of children or grandchildren, whether it's the love of our grandparents or our parents that, Lord, we grow into, or husbands and wives. And so there's a variety of different things that you give to we could experience love. But you want us to ultimately begin to, Lord, experience your love to the point that we love like you do. Not just those that we like, but even those that we don't know and those that we might not like, that we could still have a love for them. And I know a part of that comes with us maturing. Another part of it just comes with us deepening in with you. And Lord, turning your Holy Spirit loose that we become like you because the same Spirit that resided in you now leads and guides us. I thank you for these words of prophecy, Lord, of we always think of the future and they are futuristic in the extent that they will be completed someday. But I give you thanks that, Lord, there are ways that these prophecies even can be fulfilled in our day in minor ways. And tonight, Lord, I just pray that I'm following you and that I would not misrepresent what your word says nor what your spirit would lead, but pray instead that, God, I would be able to get out of the way so that you would be the way, the truth, and the life that you are. I pray that you might use my voice, but God, that it would be beyond me. And I thank you that, Lord, that you will partner with not just me tonight in this service, but with every one of us in whatever the service is that you call us to do, that we can learn to do it with you. And it doesn't mean that it won't have sweat and doesn't mean that it'll always be fun and all in that regard, but God, it just can be rewarding and fulfilling if we know that we accomplished something that we couldn't have done without you. And I just give you thanks. Lord, I pray to be a beacon for you. I pray to be a voice of hope, um, to be encouraging, but also to be truthful. And so I ask tonight that, Lord, you would speak through me and my words would fall to the ground, but yours might not only enter the ear, but also the heart and the soul and be th something that we need right now, but also a seed planted that will grow that we'll need in the future. I ask the Lord as well for the teachers teaching our children down below. For you to, dear God, bless this church with that generation uh, more and more that would come in, that would be these elementary age children, that God and Father, that we would have a future that would live way beyond us and few tarry in returning. And Jesus, I pray all this in your name to your glory. Amen. So as we've looked at uh, this book of Revelation, that started into chapter 21. The last few weeks, uh, I've been looking at just a few of the first things that come out of it with this newness in mind. And I'm going to read to you um, this first part of it, not uh, any more than just a paragraph and a half or so, or two paragraphs, if you will. So Revelation 21, John talking, and then he said, I saw what God revealed to him was this new heaven and new earth for the first heaven, first earth had passed away. So did John see them being removed? But he knows that this is taking their place. And there was no longer any sea, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and so we think about a great big city, and maybe that's where the uh, streets of gold and the uh, pearl gates and all that. 
But uh, we're not necessarily told that because he shifts immediately from talking about this new Jerusalem into talking about it being like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, which could be and would be the church. And I heard then a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. He will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. For the old order, and this is important, the old order, just like the old heaven and the earth, has passed away. He was seated on the throne and said, Look, I am making everything new. And that's exciting. Um, that he's really remaking everything new. And he said, write this down, for these are the words of the, are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is finished, or it is done, excuse me. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I'll give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes or is victorious will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and then he's got to throw this one in in case it didn't hit one of us already, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. We'll stop with that because what I want to look at tonight is with this concept continuing on with I'm going to make all things new. And that in his newness, it's really the nature of Christ. Uh, we read in here that he is the Alpha and the Omega. And it would be, and most of you are aware, that it's like our English alphabet of the A to the Z. But the Alpha and the Omega were the Greek letters. And unless you were in a fraternity or sorority, it probably didn't make much sense to you. But if you've watched Animal House or some of those uh, Revenge of the Nerds, you've seen the Greek symbols. And they still didn't make much sense. But okay, you just don't want to be a Delta, Delta, Delta or whatever it was, you know. Um, anyway, so he said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. And I... I want you to know that in that, that it's so much more than just bookends. But what he is saying is, I am complete. I am the beginning and I am the end, but I'm everything in between. And everything that I've said, I am going to bring to fulfillment. And everything that exists is as a result of Jesus Christ bringing it into existence. And like I mentioned Sunday, that we're all made out of what? Dust. And this amazing thing, we're all out of dust, and yet look at us. We can move, we're animated, we can talk, we can think, we can feel and reason. We're made in the image of God. doesn't mean that God's dust. It's just that he took something as simple as dust and has created life from it. And that life then each has individual instincts and individual fingerprints and DNA that nobody else has. He made that, and yet he made it in a way that one part of it, the inner part that can't be seen, will live forever and ever, but the outer part will go back to dust. And it's no different than it is with growing up on a farm and the implements and all that, you know, as I was growing up, there would be farmers that would have stuff out, and usually it was in kind of a waterway or a place where the trees had grown up. There are not a lot of trees in Illinois, at least in the farming country, but there would be old horse-drawn plows stuck out there under a tree someplace or the tree growing up through it. There'd be the older cultivators and the various equipment that they used to use and things that they just threw away that people that now like to collect old stuff would go, holy smokes, what are you doing with that just out there in the middle of nowhere? Do you know what that's worth? When Tommy Phillips um, went with me on Father's Day, a trip we took up north, um, he was blown away when he saw the barns and then the sheds and then the attics of the barns and one thing like that. And he's like, Man, they've got a lot of cool stuff here, Dennis. And Dad goes, yeah, one of these days we're going to have to get rid of it. He goes, why don't you just have a sale? You know, let's go ahead. and you got those hay racks. Let's get it put out there and let's do it. You know, and Dad, we'll get around to it one of these days. And it's stuff that we've just had around, but it's gotten old enough that it's got value to it. Now, nonetheless, but if it's left alone, what happens to all those old things? They deteriorate and become nothing. It takes an iron piece of iron a long time, I'm sure, to go back to dust, but it eventually will rust away, won't it? And, uh, you know, some of these things that we call antiques, you know, and it's just depending on some person's viewpoint of it. I always laugh and think at the church yard sale that I think the reason it's so successful is because you all are so good that at least 30 to 40 percent of the stuff just gets recycled from family to family within the church because, oh, I saw that last year. I'm going to get it this year, you know. And, and so anyway, the idea being is in our minds, we want brand new. And yet at the same time, there's value in the old. But the truth is, 
once things begin to deteriorate, it's like we throw them away. God does not. He is the giver of life. And that's what this cry out is to him from heaven, although he's been up there. He's crying out to his church and he's saying, look, you don't understand. I love you. I look at you like a husband would look at his wife as this beautiful bride coming down the aisle. Can't wait to be joined in marriage with you. He said, you don't understand. I love you like a father would love a child. I love you. And I mean, that's this picture. And he wants to give us life. And it's so cool because he is the giver of life to the extent not only can he give life to nothing. And I think of Ezekiel where the valley of dry bones and he tells the prophet, speak, speak to those bones. And he did, and they came to life. They started clanking and clicking and coming back together, and the hip bone got connected to the whatever, you know? And, and all these, these bones and this, this, that have been bleached out and everything else because of the word of God through the prophet of God, he spoke to them, and they came to life. And you see, that's what this message of Christianity is about. It's not just about don't be bad. It's about, man, look at your life and understand it's deteriorating. It's death itself. And I don't just mean your life, but I'm talking about really your failures and everything else like that. But he's saying, but it's not beyond my touch. Because I can make all things, what? New. All things. I can take that which wasn't and make it happen. And that's the most unbelievable thing of all, is that really Jesus started with nothing. Some of you may have read about the uh, atheist that was arguing with God and everything like that. And he finally came to him and said, look, God, I'm ready to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and create man. I'm just like you. And God said, okay, when do you want to do that? He said, tomorrow. Let's meet at noon. So they got together at noon, and God showed up and is patiently waiting there in a the cloud. And here this professor is, this atheist professor, and he's got the, there, and he's got all this stuff, and he's about to make man. He said, so let's go at it. And God said, wait a minute. Get your own dirt. You know, because you wouldn't have dirt if I hadn't given it to you, so you've got to start from scratch. Now, this picture of it, what I want to do tonight looking at it is go back with John because I think it's ironic. I mean, I don't know why was John picked and not Peter to write this book. I don't know. I mean, Peter's dead by this time, but I don't think it's just that. I don't know what it really means when John calls himself all the time the disciple whom Jesus loved because it sounds kind of egotistical or like I was his favorite. But in some regards, he was because they're at the crucifixion. What did he say? But John, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. And so there was a close connection there. I don't know. I wonder if John was the one that had the fewest doubts in, about the love of God, because that's why he talked about I'm loved. Or whether it was just that John wanted to remind himself that I am the one that Jesus loved, meaning that I'm not the only one. But I'm fully convinced that Jesus loves me, this I know. And it wasn't just because of him for the Bible tells him so, because the New Testament wasn't written, but it was because he experienced the life of Christ here on this earth. And he became so thoroughly convinced that it had nothing to do with anything that he had done. It was who he was now that he was with Christ. And so I think it's out of that relationship and John's steadfast faithfulness that no matter what was happening to him, no matter what prison he was in, no matter what beating he took, or now that he was exiled out here on this desert island, he still believed God loved him. And so if you go back to chapter one, you read that what day was it of the week that John was caught up in the spirit, but the Lord's day. So on Sunday, on the day that Jesus rose from the dead and that Christians have tried to memorialize or to keep in mind by worshiping on the first day of the week, that Jesus came back from the dead. John is in the spirit, and although in prison, he is able to remove his surroundings and his circumstances and to allow the presence and the peace of God to be there, so much to the point that he's caught up in the spirit into the air, and he begins to see these things. Was it the plan from the beginning? I don't know. Or was it that God just saw this devotion of John and the love that he had and said, I'm going to use you one more time. And I'm going to tell you something I didn't tell the 12. And I'm going to give you pictures because, John, you've got to get the church excited about this. They're misunderstanding and they're seeing, as what John also wrote, that uh, the church was beginning to use sin or grace as a license to sin. And as John saw this happening, it troubled him. But Jesus saw it happen, it troubled him more. He said, no, that's not what it's about. That's the spirit of the Antichrist that would deny that Jesus came in the flesh. Or the spirit of the Antichrist also would go ahead and, and deny the fact that it's this surrender. 
Why would you want a cheap grace? And so anyway, with this in mind, I want to finish up with what I started last week and go to the book of Hebrews chapter 10, if you will. And I just want to quickly look at, because last week what we were focused on was this making all things new. And back here in Hebrews chapter 10 is this passage, and it does mention, obviously, about new, or I wouldn't be going to it, right? And so if you will, let's go to Hebrews 10, verse 19. Hebrews 10, 19. Again, one of those that I often quote, and the reason being it's important to me to remind myself to not quit, to not give up, but to keep going. So Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, uh, what's that? Not just the holy of holies, it's more holy than that. It's where the existence of God is. And how do we get there? By the blood of Jesus. And what does he call this blood of Jesus? The new and living way opened up for us. And then he gives the Old Testament analogy of the tabernacle here. And he says, through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let's draw near to God. So this writer is really trying not to scold them, but rather instead to encourage them. And from the get-go or the beginning, he's writing and saying, man, remember how the children of Israel, they didn't have enough faith. They gave up on it and started doing their own thing. He said, no, man, look at all we've got going. They had Moses and Moses is great, but Jesus is greater yet. So he says, we've got this new way, new and living way open through us, the curtain that is his body. And since we have this great priest over the house of God, so Jesus not only was a sacrifice in the curtain that got ripped open that we have access to God, but on top of it then, Jesus Christ is also this priest interceding on our behalf between us and God. And let us then, verse 22 says, draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Now, I personally think that that's a reference to baptism because it's one of the things that seems to enter in throughout a lot of the New Testament writers is this reference to the water. But uh, nonetheless, with the blood of Christ, I mean, we have had our hearts cleansed from the guilty conscience. And that is unless what? Unless we go back and do what we used to do and then our conscience will be guilty. But you know what? That's what the devil wants. He wants you to live with a guilty conscience. Because that will rob your joy, that will rob your peace, that will rob you from this relationship with God. The devil works with guilt. The Holy Spirit works with something that's similar, but it's called conviction. There's a big difference between the two. Conviction can mean I know I'm guilty, but conviction says, but I'm also convicted to two things. I'm convicted I did wrong, but Jesus Christ has paid for it. And with your forgiveness, Lord, I'm going to pick up and I want to overcome this. Guilt, on the other hand, just lets you wallow in the guilt and feel like everything that happens wrong to you, it's because you're guilty. And that's what the devil wants you is this continual state of guilt. God wants your conscience cleansed. He wants you to be able to, with openness, like a child running up to grandma or grandpa, like a child running to their parent or whatever. You know, kids just get so darned excited. And it's just so cool to see them carefree. I mean, have any, any of you ever had three-year-old in the house? You ever had the three-year-old going, how in the world are you going to pay all the bills this week? <laughs> Three-year-olds don't ask about the bills. Sorry, but 13-year-olds don't ask about the bills either. They think it's all still free. You know, but I mean, three-year-olds just aren't occupied by that. And there's a part of that childlike faith that we're supposed to have that says, God's got this. That's not about being irresponsible. It's instead, though, about at the same time not believing you're alone. And so that's what I love about this passage, that he's made things new, this new and living way open for us. So we get rid of this guilty conscience. We have bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold unswervingly, in other words, straight ahead, dead on, man, to the hope that we profess for he who promised is what? Absolutely, positively faithful. Jesus will do what he said he would do. So hold on to that. Don't let the devil be that other voice in your head that talks you out of it. He is faithful. And then, while we know that Jesus is faithful, let's consider then how we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Why? Because it's hard to spur yourself on sometimes. But there's something that's weird about the fact when you're encouraging somebody else, it does encourage you. But the other thing is, is when you're partnered up with the family of God, there's also an encouragement that just comes from that that helps you to do more than you would have ever done by yourself. So let's unhold unswervingly to this hope 
And then let's consider how we can spur one another on. And I want to encourage you to do that with your devotional time. You just take a time tomorrow and say, God, how can I spur somebody on tomorrow or today? And then he said, verse 25, let us not give up meeting together. Some are in the habit of doing. But instead of that, instead of giving up meeting, let's meet and, and let's encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day, and that's talking about the judgment day, approaching the day of Jesus' return. Encourage each other. But yet we know a lot of the prophecies are it's going to go from bad to worse. So what do you need if it's going to go from bad to worse? Encouragement. So do you see how this encouragement comes in there? Spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. Encouraging each other not to give up, but to keep on. And sometimes I think that we get to in this martyr complex or the victim complex. And, and again, don't, don't misunderstand me. There are people that have been tortured and there are people that have been mistreated severely and badly. I mean, I love listening to Joyce Myers. I don't always love listening to her, but I, I listen to Joyce Myers anyway. And, you know, she has routinely shared about her background and her, what she came out of. And it's pretty horrible. But she's not tied to it anymore. God set her free. But yet it's out of her own trouble that she had that she's ministering to others because there's not a lot of us can say what she says and be able to tell somebody else. And I know it's not ever true. I know exactly how you feel, but I know somewhat how you feel. Because if you've been there and done that, you can at least relate. And that's where she can. And so God's using her to encourage others. Verse 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of truth there's no sacrifice for sins left what's deliberate sinning i think that's when we know what we're doing right uh, if it's not deliberate it's accidental but there's times that we've accidentally slipped up and then there's times that we knew what we were doing the whole time we were doing it and he just this writer puts this warning out and he said if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, just a fearful expectation, expectation of judgment and raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Now, some people read that and go, <gasps> and that's good. But it can be handled how? Don't be an enemy of God. Be a friend of God. And that's what we looked at Monday night with the guys group is Abraham was a friend of God because he feared God in the right way and lived for him because he believed he would do what he said he would do. Going from there, if you will, let's jump over to 2 Peter and we'll wrap this up with this looking at the old being made new that way. But then I want to go back and do something fun, at least fun to me. So I don't know if somebody moved my paper clip. I wonder who that was. If you will, 2 Peter chapter 3, probably me, right? Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. And this whole passage, like I said, chapter 3 opens up with the day of the Lord. So the very thing that that writer back in Hebrews just talking about getting ready for that day. But um, I'm not going to read all of it here, but let's pick it up with verse 8. Okay, verse 8. 2 Peter 3, 8. But do not forget this one thing. Huh, that must be pretty important, doesn't it? Or isn't it? For him to say, don't forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like what? thousand years but also a thousand years is just like a day why would he say don't forget that well the reason is is because we have this tendency to want to run everything by a clock and especially if you're a little OCD or if you're a lot OCD or if you're also one of those prompt people that you know five minutes early is almost late versus the I won't mention any names of certain families we have that you can kind of you know the race to be the tortoise and the hare, you know, or whatever. But, but, you know, I mean, what's late? Well, fashionably late, they can call it that. But, you know, anyway, I heard this one phrase one time, and I really like it. God is seldom early, but he's never late. Might be late according to my timetable, but he's not according to what's best. Faith can be patient, waiting in it. It's also to help us, because I think even in our human lives, we can look at things. I don't know if it's just coincidental, but... I find that I'm saying now what a lot of old people used to say. You know, you talk about how you feel a lot more than you used to talk about how you felt. Because <laughs> you know, the only time anybody ever talked about how they felt in high school was after the Friday and Saturday night. How would you feel after that? You know, but, but man, old people, boy, they'll tell you all about it, won't they? 
what's regular and what's not, what's routine, what's not, what have you been eating, you know, and all this good stuff. But, but anyway, if you're older, you look back and, man, time what? Flies. Can you believe that we're already three-fourths of the way through this year? Nearly, anyway. Whoa, how'd that happen? Just like that. And yet, man, when you were that kid in school, time drug on and on and on. And saying God's that same way. But I think what Peter's letting us know and trying to remind us of this is, is first of all, that Jesus is going to come back and it's going to be quicker than you think it would. And why would we be surprised at that? Because what Jesus keeps saying every time he says it, he said, I'm going to come back like a thief in the night. But when you least expect it. And so that's what he's trying to get us to understand is, is that don't let either the length of time cause you to go, oh, well, it's never going to happen, or the shortness of time to think you don't have time to get ready, because you do. And so Peter's writing this, and I'm sorry, I'll get back onto this, okay? So remember it, he said. So when your days drag on like years, God said it would be that way. And when your years speed by like days, God said it's that way, he can relate. But the Lord, all in all, the Lord is not what? Slow. He doesn't ride the short bus when it comes to keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He doesn't do that. He's patient with you. Not wanting what? Not wanting anyone, not one person to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And I think it's so cool that Peter let us in on that, that even for believers that he's writing to, he said, man, we still need to repent. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare or be destroyed. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? So he's saying, logically, let's just think about it. If that's what's going to happen, he said, what do we want to be? He said, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and you speed its coming. That will bring about, the, that, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking, because of the promise of Jesus, we're looking forward to a what? New heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, what should we do? Let's make every effort, do everything we can to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Cool. Now, with that in mind, so this whole setting up of chapter 21 he goes into that and says that this is going to pass away and this is going to pass away and this is going to be made new and this is going to be made new and i just want to go back and look at this alpha and omega the jesus that came as the baby in the manger and i don't have to go back and actually technically look at it because most of us are pretty aware of that we get warm fuzzies when we think about that but to the jesus that died on the cross that he accomplished in 33 years all that the father sent him to do Man, I'm about twice that now, and I can't say that. Can you? I mean, do any of you sometimes wonder, what, no, what, give me a clue, God. What, did you want, what do you want me to do? And it's just amazing how time can fly when we've got it so good. So I want to go back and look at John, because that's who's writing Revelation. I want to go back to the Gospel of John. So if you will, let's go back to John chapter 2. Now, I'm going to skip over this first part, that in the beginning was the Word, and I'm going to skip over the part where... John the Baptist starts pointing out Jesus, but I want to go to chapter 2 because this was the first experience that these people that went ahead and that Jesus didn't make. He said, follow me if you want, and they chose to. This is the first experience that they had with him. First of all, he's just a guy, and he's one of these guys that at that time there are no, numerous revolutionary people going on, and Jesus comes onto the scene, and he didn't really have an entourage, and he hadn't put his political campaign together very good. He just started calling willy-nilly these guys, and but it wasn't the kind of guys that most of the big shots wanted for their presidency. Jesus was willing to take the common man. But we read then on chapter 2, verse 1, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples, plural, also had been invited to the wedding. Now, we don't know how long this has taken place, how long these disciples have followed him. Some of them followed John for a while, but, but they're following Jesus now. And I think that, I mean... That's just so, I don't know, not normal for us today. I mean, I don't know what it would take for somebody to come along and say, hey, come follow me. And I go, sure. Because I'd probably go, why? I mean, can you imagine that? Somebody just saying, come follow me. Okay. Uh, but they did. 
And it's like, okay, we're going to go to a wedding. My cousin's getting married. We're going to go to a wedding. They said you guys could come. Well, man, nobody would take an extra whatever. You know, I don't think they're full 12 yet, but most of them were there. So they went. Verse 3, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they've got no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? <laughs> That's about as respectful as you can get, you know. What's he saying? <laughs> What do you, come on, you think I, it's, yeah, I, you think it's, I got this magic act going on, it's time to perform or what, you know, I mean, but, but she's basically, you can see needling him with her elbow and said, they're out of wine, and she probably means, these guys you brought have sure taken their fair share, now I, I, I that's reading between the lines, but Knowing where they came from, who knows? You know, they may have been saying, hey, it's an open bar, let's go. But uh, they're out of wine. And maybe that's what she's implying. And these friends that you brought along have sure done their share of taking it. So he says, why are you involving me? My time has not yet come. Now, what a strange response is that? But you see, Jesus had a schedule. Now, I'm not saying it was all laid out. But he went to God, and I believe daily, and he allowed the Holy Spirit to lead him to what he was to do and the next step he was to take. And he said, my time has not yet come. It's not time for me to reveal myself as what I think is implied here. But his mother still went ahead and pushed the envelope and said to the servants, just do whatever he tells you. Now talk about putting the pressure on. Yeah, you had a mom like that that would go ahead and it's like, I really don't want to sing, Mom, no. But you've been taking lessons. You can do it, you know. I don't want to play. Yeah, but you can do it. Here, you're good with electricity. You fix this thing, you know. I mean, all kinds of things our moms will get us to do. And obviously, I'm off this track here a little bit. So let's get back to this. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Verse 6, nearby stood six stone water jars. And I always get a kick out of that because they're standing there. Like, did these water jars have legs or what? You know, but uh, they were... I would have said they were sitting there, but nope. It says there stood there six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Now, I mean, that's a lot. And, but it's kind of weird, isn't it, that these six pots or stone water jars that were 20 to 30 gallons, I mean, I know a five-gallon bucket, and, you know, then you're talking about that small barrel, you know, of oil or whatever you might buy. There's six of those. But they're used for what? Ceremonial washing. So my guess is, I mean, I don't know, but my guess is the people been either putting their hands down in there and washing, you know, and drying them out ceremonially, however they did that, or that they had been dipping out of those for that, because maybe they were empty. But it said they were standing there, so Jesus said, okay, we're going to use those. He said to the servants, fill the jars with water. I just said, Rinse them out first and then fill them with water. But no, he just said, fill them with water. So they did, clear to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out, take it to the master of the banquet. So they did. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from. The servants who had drawn the water knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, man, he said, this is unbelievable. Everyone brings out the choice wine first. And then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you've saved the best till now. So it was really, really good wine. This is the first miraculous sign Jesus performed at Canaan Gallery. I want the rest of that story, man. I'd like to know a little bit more about that. But I find that that's just, first of all, I mean, can you imagine Mary? That, that's my boy. You know? He told me he's going to be wonderful. That's one of his names. And man, that just makes me feel so good that you saved the day. But she was probably wanting to go, oh, it was my son that did it. And Jesus made her shut up about that because it was like, I mean, he's just so cool, man. Just undercover here. Just no, don't make any big deal out of it. But the servants knew. Do you ever wonder what happened to those servants? How did that change their life? And did they start following him? Did they start at least wanting to know more about that guy that showed up and saved the day when they ran out of wine? Nobody else could have gone and made wine and probably couldn't have gone afforded to go and buy that much wine. But here Jesus just made somewhere between what? 
six times 25, 150 gallons, just like that, turned water into wine. What's the important part? The important part to me here in this story, I mean, there's all kinds of little side lights there and stuff, which I like to get into because I just think the scriptures are marvelous when you, you, you really shine the light on you see the facets like a diamond, you know. But, but the thing I wanted us to see tonight and to grasp from this is with Jesus. That John, this John that's writing Revelation now and, and seeing these things that are unspeakable, had already seen unspeakable things because he watched this guy speak, never touched, no magic wand, no abracadabra, but just speak and said, you go fill them with water and then take it up and give it to the master of ceremonies. John remembers that. I mean, that was a standout thing. It was Jesus' first miracle on earth, but it's the first miracle that John had seen that wasn't, you know, I mean, that's way beyond the scope of what you normally would think a miracle the Son of God would do. There's a lot of churches that have trouble with the fact that they want to say Jesus made good grape juice. But it was wine. And I'm not trying to argue one way or the other here to legitimize or whatever else. I'm just saying John saw that. And so when he sees and hears these other things, this disciple whom Jesus loved was a disciple that loved Jesus greatly. He knows that in the beginning of John's first time with Jesus, he saw him do something entirely impossible. He changed elements. And he didn't need any time to do it. It was instant. He changed the elements of H2O into wine. And I share that with you because I think that's what I want you to understand. As John wrote this thing, there's so much compacted into these few words that he chose. But when he said he was the beginning and the end, John, I can't help but think, went back and remembered his beginning. And that was the first thing that he saw. And so why is he surprised that Jesus is going to make all things new? He's not. And he can do anything he wants out of anything that's before him. As well as save the day and please his mom and whatever else. But I mean, the biggest thing is, is don't doubt him. He can do it. And if he destroys something, it's because he's going to build it back better. But I think this is just so cool. And I hope that you catch a moment out of it as well. John chapter 2. Chapter 3, we got Nicodemus, but go over to 4. In chapter 4, John is with him on this journey, and they intentionally go through, even though most of the Jewish people would have done anything they, they could to stay, steer around Samaria, they go through Samaria. And the whole deal there, it's difficult for us to relate, other than we've seen plenty of prejudice in various ways over the history of our country, and um, there's still stuff that we're aware of in the world today, uh, but the Samaritans were despised by the true Jews, and it was because they had compromised the Jewish bloodline, and they just hold it against them. And so then the other group begins to this and that. And if you remember, even after David died and Solomon came in, there became a divided kingdom, and Samaria was the capital of that one, and Jer Jerusalem was the capital of the other, and there was Judah and Israel. And it was after that, anyway, that this, this division happened that was more of a division than ever been there before. And so Jews look with disdain. They despise the Samaritans. And Jesus said, let's go through it. So, picking it up down, verse 4, so chapter 4, verse 4. Now, he'd, he had to go through Samaria. That's an interesting choice. It doesn't mean that there was no other way. I think it really implies Jesus was bound to determine they were going to go through Samaria because he was called to. So, he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. You've got to go back to Genesis, read about that. But he'd given this plot of ground... And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, and I've got tired circled in my Bible. You know why? Isn't it cool to know that he really did get into flesh and he even felt exhaustion? Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which most believed to be noon, and it, all the different ways they kept time is kind of different there, but about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Not just a Samaritan, but on top of that, a woman. How can you even ask me for a drink? 
And then the parenthetical, for Jews don't associate with Samaritans. And Jesus, like he oftentimes did, doesn't really talk directly to the question you're asked. He tries to steer it towards something else. And he answered it. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, I don't know about you, but I mean, there's a part of that 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 would have been a little bit confusing to me. To this day, I mean, I heard and read and, you know, thought about on my own the different things that this could mean. But I mean, let's just break this down a second. If you knew the gift of God. The gift of God, obviously, is Jesus Christ who takes away the sin of the world. The gift of God is grace. The gift of God is that forgiveness that comes with the grace. That becoming a child of God that comes with that. That all is a derivative of Jesus being who he was. If you knew the gift of God and if you knew who it is that asked you that I am actually the very son of God and I'm asking you for a drink, first of all, I think he's, what I would have said was, man, you'd have gone ahead and said, I'd be delighted to, not questioning me. But he said, if you would have asked for a drink, you would have, or you could have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, that living water, and he goes on to explain it. She said, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? I I feel sarcastically, I don't know that it was, but this living water, you know. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it? So it shows back, see, because the Jews did have roots in Abraham. And so she said, are you saying you're better than the patriarch Jacob? You're greater than Jacob? I mean, he gave us this well, and he drank from it himself, and it's been here this long, you know, and so did his sons and his flocks and his herds. Jesus answered. He didn't get belligerent back with her. He didn't go ahead and rise up and show her. Well, I'll show you. Jesus said that the one that drinks this water is still going to be thirsty again sometime, but whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst guess who forgot to turn their phone off man oh man can you believe that busted busted i felt that thing in my pocket and i just stuck it in there anyway he says if you knew i would give him water and he'd never thirst indeed the water that i give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life and so is he talking about the holy spirit because he mentioned gift And the Holy Spirit is certainly a gift that comes with our salvation, with Christ. Or is he talking about just this flooding of refreshment, you know, that can go ahead and just literally bubble up inside of us? It's the part that I think as Americans that we struggle to experience because we try to get those good feelings off of other things. And we have so many things that tantalize us and fascinate us and everything like that that I don't know that we really allow God to well up within us. I think there's times, I think there's church services, I think there's certain songs and there's certain things that get said, there's certain events or things that people might do that will cause us at that moment. But can you be alone with God and just allow Him to well up inside of you to the point that you thirst no more? that you truly experience God and you know that you know that you know that even though this world right now is maybe not treating you fair, that there's a God that is going to go ahead and not only give you a completely fair judgment, but on top of that will judge your offenders. This living water, I I believe, is tied very strongly to the Holy Spirit. And I think that it's our flesh that oftentimes keeps us from allowing the Spirit to minister to us. It's not only that, it's sometimes I think some have seen or watched or heard of other churches where there's the Holy Spirit seem to be out of control and I'm not accusing or accosting them. I'm just saying, depending on how you're raised, there are certain things that take place. I mean, like this handling of snakes and all that to some people that would just go, and I'm one of those that would just go, hey, I think I've got some place I need to be. You know, my phone just rang, I'll be right back, you know. Um, But for them... They're doing it because it's a part of their faith. Some I've heard milk the snakes, so they're faking it, but I don't care even if it's a rattlesnake that supposedly has got all the poison out of it. I wouldn't trust it, would you? And I still think it would hurt if they sink those fangs in, you know? 
And uh, so call it whatever you may. But I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, the, the pneumos, this powerful air and the wind of God that Jesus promised that he would give to us that believed in him, that he promised and told his disciples that as you baptize the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that that spirit would be a part of them. Or Peter later on said that you will receive forgiveness and the Holy Spirit. Man, that have we ever even asked the Lord she at least was smart enough to say, give me some of this water. Have you? Because I'm not so sure, but what, well, I do know that there was another place where Jesus talked about in prayer that the, the guy that wouldn't give his son a, a scorpion instead of an egg or a snake instead of bread or whatever it was, you know, he talked about that and he said, and my father who is in heaven will give good gifts to his children. He'll even give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And I'm just saying that I think that the key to asking for the Holy Spirit isn't to have a new toy to play with or to show off. It's rather instead to have this everlasting life that no matter what you're going in or through, that you can be still enough inside to hear the Spirit going, hey, we're not unaware. This is part of the plan. Keep going. Keep going. That's living water, folks. When you're you're in, you're done, you're ready to quit. And you can hear the Holy Spirit say, not now. Come on, I'm with you. Together we're going to do this. That's what this woman needed. With some encouragement. She didn't get the Holy Spirit first, she got the word of Christ first. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming. So she's still looking at it from the flesh. And I honestly believe that, you know, my personal experience, what I've viewed in others is that, that it is our flesh that keeps us from truly experiencing the Spirit. It's our flesh because we go from one extreme to the other of, well, then give it to me so I can do this, or as she said, so I don't have to keep coming to this well. Jesus wasn't talking about thirst for her physical body. It was a thirst for the soul and a quenching for that soul. It's again the reason why Satan loves to manipulate us with guilt. The Holy Spirit just wants to bring conviction so we can get back on track again and repent and let's pick up. The three-year-old that got scolded and cried a little bit, and Dad said, come on, okay. It's time to quit crying, let's go. The Holy Spirit wishes to minister to each one of us that way and when we are ministered to, then the Holy Spirit will as we are filled up, we'll minister through us. And again, it's so easy, I don't care, a preacher or what area in the church you're at, to minister out of the flesh, but it's not the same as when it comes from the Spirit. But she said she wanted some, and he said, all right, he said, why don't you go call your husband so he can come and get some too. She said, I don't have a husband. And this is when Jesus just completely lets her know, I know so much about you that I know you're right when you say you told the truth, you have no husband, but the fact is you've had five of them and the man that you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. How would you have reacted to that then? Find a hole, crawl in it, let me jump in the well, right? I don't want somebody that knows everything about me. But I think Jesus, with this story that he's speaking to this woman, is speaking to us. I think that he's trying to tell us, I know everything about you. And I still want to give you everlasting life and everlasting water. My spirit still wants to dwell in you. And if you're in my blood, he can. There's nothing he can't overcome or forgive unless you blaspheme him. I mean, that just amazes me. And it shows that she took to heart because she left there and went and told everybody to come out and meet this man that she met. She said, I believe he's the one. He told me everything about me. And instead of it turning her off, it freed her up. 
And I think that that's one of the things that um, American Christians struggle with is that we don't want anybody to know. And it keeps us bound instead of free. The Holy Spirit knows. And that's why he's so able to minister to every one of our weaknesses. It's why Paul encourages us to, you know, live by the Spirit, to let the Spirit be free. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. And so I want to just encourage you that before we experience the newness of heaven, why don't we experience a little heaven on earth here with the presence of God? Why don't we marvel with John at Jesus' ability to do things that humanly are not possible? And not marvel long, but just believe he can do anything. Because it's oftentimes, I wonder if we discourage him. Because he's ready, willing, and able to step in. But we have premeditated things of the way we think we want him to step in. And he's saying, no, I've got a different way. I've got a way that will not only bring you life, but will bring life through you to others. So, anybody tonight want a little living water? Because that passage in Revelation 21 mentioned that. That spring of the water of living, or the spring of living water. It's still available. And, uh, I think sometimes we just don't ask. But I want you to know that John believed that it's okay to be completely real and naked before God in the sense of no hiding. He knows it all and still loves us. And that's another reason I believe that John was picked is because he never gave up on that. He continued to believe that in spite of his mess ups, even though he could point to Peter's real quick, John had his own. The one thing he believed with all of his heart was, Jesus really loves me. God tonight, as um, we share a part of that love with the communion that you offer us, an opportunity to participate in your body and your blood, your death, your burial, your resurrection, to practice, Lord, the toast that will happen in heaven above when the wedding of the lamb and the bride comes to, Lord, that moment when you will choose each of us individually to stand before the entire universe, to share, shower your love upon us and to tell the world what all you saw instead of us being so familiar with all the things the devil reminds us of. God, I pray for you to Help me and for anybody else that's here tonight to release, let go, to ask that you would fill us with your spirit, not so that we can show off, not so that we can leap tall buildings with a single bound, just so we won't be discouraged, but we'll be filled with hope, so that we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds, because even when we're tired, you'll give us strength. When we'll believe that sometimes we're tired because there's an appointment that you've got for us to meet somebody else as we sit down on that bench or at that table at the restaurant. Not just to eat food and get refreshed, but rather instead an appointment with somebody that needs to hear from you through us. God, I pray that... Um, we would experience your love like John believed it. That we would not just theoretically know that you love us, but that, God, that we would believe it. Not like spoiled brats that, oh, well, I can do whatever I want to do, but rather instead also not like those that are fearful that everything we do is wrong. But, God, that when we do confess and we repent, it's instantly done. Everything's restored. The relationship with you is enhanced. And the Spirit's free to work. So tonight, Lord, as we take communion, speak to us, I pray. Holy Spirit, let us get used to your voice and your prompts.
to get your, used to your smile and the smile of God and to believe that you really have given us life and eternal life on top of that so that we can share life and eternal life with others that no man would have to perish but that everyone, Lord, could be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.